everybody, it's me Smilo here and it's Mei Ling Su and we are here at a museum at UTEP which is a college in El Paso, Texas and they have a museum so we are at a UTEP museum in El Paso, Texas check out all this we believe that this is a room of paleontology see it? and then if you look up there yeah look at that winged pterosaur that we believe it's a pteranodon looks like one to us see that wingspan See that long beak? Yeah, can you believe that these creatures were not actually dinosaurs? Yeah, we, we often call them dinosaurs even though they're not dinosaurs. Yeah, take a look at that, we're right underneath. That's pretty cool, right? Yeah, look at that sky. Just hanging from the ceiling as long as he doesn't come up alive and tries to swoop down and eat us. Yeah, these creatures mostly went after creatures like fish, they fed on fish. Yeah, look at that long beak, that long wingspan, those, yeah, pretty cool pterosaur. El Paso's prehistoric elephants. Yeah, check this out, they got fossils of both mammoths and mastodons in here. See all these pretty cool, yeah, look at these pretty cool exhibits right here. Wow, that's pretty cool. See, these are the fossil dig sites where they found mammoths and mastodons. And by the way, feel free to pause the video if you ever want to read information. But yeah, those are the fossil dig sites and then the people who excavated the fossils. See them? Wow, that's pretty cool. So feel free to pause the video if you want to read any of this. And I look at that mammoth right there on the wall. It looks like a cave drawing. Tusks, trunk, the head. Yeah, it looks like those primitive cave drawings. But yeah, check this out. Prehistoric elephants of El Paso. So. Here's proof that there were elephants, like mammoths and mastodons in El Paso. So if you want, you could just pause the video and read the information right there. Yeah, they got a lot of pretty cool fossils too. Yeah, check this out. And then they have a little replicas of a mammoth and a mastodon right here. They look like they're made of wood. So I'm pretty sure you could spot the differences. These are both prehistoric elephants, but people often confuse them for the same animal. But let's go through the differences of these creatures, yeah? So yeah, you could pretty you could see the differences between mammoths and mastodons. So if you see that, com compare them together. Mammoths stand taller than mastodons at the shoulder. They have a much arched shoulder than mastodons. Also, mammoths have a much bulkier head compared to mastodons. And also their tusks. See their tusks? Yeah. Mammoths also have much longer, more curved tusks compared to the mastodon. So yeah, I like the little wooden figures right there. A mammoth and a mastodon. So yeah, those are some of the differences between these prehistoric elephants, but the main difference is within their teeth. So yeah, we got some teeth right here and a bottom jaw right there. So that's the tooth of a mammoth right there. We believe it's from a Colombian mammoth. So that's a Colombian mammoth tooth right there, or part of it. And then you see those ones, those are mastodon teeth. So yeah, if you're wondering what the main difference between mammoths and mastodons are, is it, it's in their teeth. Mastodons have bumpy teeth for grinding stuff like leaves and twigs, while mammoths have flat teeth for grazing grass. So yeah, teeth can tell you a lot about what these animals ate. Pretty interesting, right? And right here is the bottom jaw of a mastodon. And you can see that the teeth are kind of worn down because these animals ate a lot. Yeah. So yeah, you see the mastodon jaw right there. And then right here we got a mastodon tusk. Right here you can see it's not as long and curved as a mammoth's tusk, but still mastodons have pretty big tusks, right? So yeah, here's the tusk of a mastodon. And you can also tell the age of a mammoth or a mastodon or any species of elephant by the rings of their, how many rings they have in their tusks. So it's kind of like counting the rings of a tree to tell how old it is. So yeah, but speaking of eating a lot, that is mammoth dung right there. So yeah, ma mammoths and mastodons, prehistoric elephants, spent almost 20 hours a day eating in order to survive. So yeah, that's pretty interesting, right? So yeah, to help them gain their thick layer of fat and shaggy fur coats to keep them warm in the frigid temperatures of the ice age. And these prehistoric elephants also had smaller ears and tails to regulate their body temperatures in the freezing cold temperatures of the ice age. Whereas elephants in Africa and India had much larger ears to regulate their body temperatures in the heat. So yeah, pretty interesting, right? 
and then they use their tusks to remove snow from rich vegetation hiding underneath the snow. And yeah, mastodons lived in the Americas, whereas woolly mammoths, they lived in all over the Northern Hemisphere from North America into Canada, places like Europe, Russia, Siberia, maybe even Africa. So yeah, here's proof that there were prehistoric elephants, mammoths, and mastodons in, in El Paso. So let's back up so you can get a full view of this exhibit. Pretty cool, right? So yeah, we got prehistoric elephants, mammoths, and mastodons. It's pretty awesome. We got more fossils in the El Paso area, El Paso and the Ice Age. So yeah, you can see all the pretty cool exhibits we got right here. But yeah, we want to go over them with all our friends that we brought with us. But yeah, this is El Paso and the Ice Age. So if you want to come right here, and read all the information right there. Feel free to read all that information right there. But yeah, these are all the prehistoric animals that could be found in El Paso during the Ice Age. Pretty cool, right? So yeah, we're gonna go through all of them and show you everything they got here. Pretty sure everybody is familiar with this one. Yep, it's a skull of the infamous saber-toothed cat, Smilodon. See those infamous saber fangs? The longest of these could grow up to nearly 12 inches in length, which is about a whole foot. Only about 6 inches of the fang is exposed while the rest is rooted inside the skull. Use those killer sabers to bite its prey, and it would just sit back and wait for the victim to bleed out. You wouldn't want to be bitten by this animal, getting stabbed twice with one bite. Smilodon was very powerful and robust. Imagine a big cat with a body build of a bear. Very powerful cat, much more powerful than any other cat alive today. Saratooth cat was roughly the same size as an African lion, but the largest were probably about 25 to 30 percent larger than lions. Smilodon fatalis lived in North America. It was about the same size as a lion, but twice as heavy. And the reason why it was twice as heavy as a lion, even though it was the same size, because of that extra muscle build, very muscular built cats. And it weighed about 600 pounds. While the larger species, Smilodon populator, lived in South America, and it was much larger, weighing up to probably 800 pounds. Smilodon fatalis was probably about six feet long and about three feet tall, whereas Smilodon populator was about four feet tall and eight feet long. Smilodon populator was much larger than Smilodon fatalis, and those are the two larger species of Saratooth, while Smilodon gracilis was a smaller. They had a very robust, very powerfully built body with a short bob tail and short stocky legs. That's probably why it was an ambush predator as well. It would creep close enough to its prey and launch a short range distance attack because its short bob tail meant it wasn't much of a runner because it couldn't balance with a short bob tail. Most big cats like cheetahs use their long tails to keep balance during a chase. And also Smilodon's legs were much shorter so it probably wasn't as fast as other big cats. But yeah, surely a very big, very powerful cat lived amongst other prehistoric giants and it was also a very fierce hunter able to conquer the largest prey animals like ground sloths, bison, mammoths, and mastodons, maybe even went after horses and camels too. And then we've heard some information about the fact that Smilodon had a very weak bite, but then that didn't really make sense to us. How could such a muscular predator have a weak bite? Well, a CT scan of the temporal bone of a Smilodon compared to a lion and a cheetah showed that the thickness of the bone was much thicker than the temporal bone of a lion and a cheetah. And the temporal bone is the bone that connects the jaw to the skull depending on how thick it was, determines how strong the bite force was. It gives us the muscles to move our jaws in. Depending on how thick the muscle is, it determines how strong the bite force is. And judging by the fact that Smilodon's was much thicker than a lion or a cheetah's, that must mean it had a savagely powerful bite, much stronger than a lion and a cheetah. But not everyone agrees with that because they're still stuck with the information that Smilodon had a weak bite. And another thing is, Smilodon could open its jaws up to 120 degrees wide, right? It could open its mouth wide enough to allow room for those saber teeth to bite down. And if we remember correctly, the wider an animal can open its mouth, the stronger the bite force is. Animals with a wider gape can usually have a stronger bite. Take the hippopotamus for an example. Those creatures could open their mouths up to 160 degrees wide, which gave them a savagely powerful bite. And then the same thing with the Tasmania tiger, which could probably open 120 to 130. Those creatures also had very powerful bites. That's what gives us the idea that Smilodon may have had a stronger bite. So that kind of leaves the weak bite information outdated. But then again, Smilodon didn't really need a strong bite because these teeth were designed for stabbing, not crushing. If it bit too hard and those fangs ran into bone, those fangs would likely snap, and then the saber-tooth killing technique would be useless. These creatures had to be very careful where they bit down, because those fangs were very fragile. But yeah, this Smilodon skull is also pretty big, right? Yeah, pretty cool Smilodon fatalis. Yeah, it's awesome Smilo. And I'm here with Dyrus the Direwolf. We're looking at two exhibits right here, and this one is a skull of the infamous Direwolf. 
And then this one's a skull of the modern day timber wolf. So yeah, this is a dire wolf skull compared to a timber wolf skull. And then I'm a gray wolf, and Divers is a dire wolf. And the timber wolf is a subspecies of gray wolf, and it is also the largest species of wolf alive today. It wasn't always that way. This was the top dog of the Ice Age, the dire wolf. You can obviously see the size difference between these two skulls. Yeah, dire wolf was much bigger than modern day gray wolf. So these guys lived all over the North American continent, from Mexico and the USA and up to Canada. And they lived amongst other prehistoric predators like saber-toothed cats, American lions, and short-faced bears. And these guys could be found in the tar pits of La Brea. So yeah, you want to get a up-close look at their skull. So yeah, see those wicked sharp teeth. Yeah, very powerful bite force, strong enough to crush through bones. An interesting fact, the dire wolf was actually once thought to be closely related to modern day wolves, but a recent discovery in their DNA has showed that dire wolves were not closely related to modern day wolves. The name went from Canis dirus to Enocyon dirus. We think we're pronouncing that correctly, right? Enocyon? So yeah, that's actually Enocyon dirus right there. And as far as we're concerned, it's still referred to as a dire wolf, even though it's not a wolf. We believe that the name Enocyon means terrible wolf. I mean, we're not sure that's what we've heard, but it could be wrong. It was kind of a letdown for us because we love wolves and this was one of our favorite prehistoric animals of the Ice Age. It's kind of a bummer that the dire wolf is not closely related to the modern day gray wolf. It's still cool, but kind of a bummer for wolf lovers out there. We believe that they still lived a similar lifestyle compared to modern day wolves. They still traveled and hunted in packs. We don't know if they howled like gray wolves do. But yeah, wolves are pretty majestic animals, right? The wolves, you know, today traveled in packs and were able to conquer such large prey animals because they had strength in numbers. Yeah, the strength of the wolf is a pack. Able to bring animals down like moose, bison, deer, elk. So yeah, the skull still looks pretty dog-like, pretty wolf-like, right? You know, Cyan Dyrus, Canis Lupus was the gray wolf. Pretty big dire wolf compared to that large timber wolf. Yeah, dire wolves were much bigger and much heavier than modern day wolves, twice as heavy. But it's still pretty cool, right, Dyrus? Yeah, totally. Glad I got to see an exhibit of my own species right here. Yeah, me too. Got a timber wolf. I'm a gray wolf, but timber wolves are a subspecies of gray wolf. Timber wolf, skull and jaw, North America's current smaller wolf compared with the extinct larger dire wolf. Skull and jaw, cast. Yeah, it's pretty cool, right? Timber wolf and a dire wolf. Pretty awesome. Here we have the bottom jaw of a giant ground sloth. So yeah, I'm here with Perot, who is a giant ground sloth. So yeah, you see this bottom jaw of a giant ground sloth right there? Yeah, it's pretty cool, Smilo. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, just take a look at these, see those peg-like teeth? These giant herbivores, the smallest of these beasts could be probably about the size of a black bear. That's pretty cool, right? So yeah, that's the smallest species of sloth, and we think this one might be Megalonyx, which was probably the smallest species of ground sloth. Could be wrong, but this is pretty small, so it probably belongs to the smaller species of sloth. Yeah, these were large, lumbering giants, look like bears with long tails and cl long claws, which they use to grip the branches of trees to eat the leaves off of them. So yeah, you see the bottom jaw right there? Pretty cool, right? Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, and these Adults were virtually indestructible. Yeah, but they were preyed upon by other predators like saber-toothed cats. So yeah, that's the bottom jaw of a ground sloth right there. Imagine how big this creature would be compared to the smaller sloths of today. Yeah, but the biggest of these beasts, a megatherium, could be about the size of an elephant. So yeah, prehistoric sloths range from the size of bears to the size of elephants. Yeah, these sloths were not as small and lazy looking as their modern day cousins, which way they are closely related to. They had a large tail to help keep them balanced as they reared up to feed off the leafy greens in the trees. So yeah, that's the bottom jaw of a giant ground sloth right there. They had long claws and large tails and these beasts look more like bears than sloths on the ground. Yeah, pretty cool, right? Sloths the size of bears and elephants. Probably doesn't get any crazier than that. We got another sloth exhibit above this giant ground sloth jaw right here. Jaw fragment, you see the peg-like teeth right there? So yeah, these creatures use their teeth to feed off the leafy greens with those peggy teeth. Pretty cool, right? Yeah, pretty cool indeed. Smile, just look at that. Looks like a small piece to a small sloth. Yeah. 
see that jaw right there? Yep, giant ground sloth right there. Well, I'm now here with Ruffalo the bison, and we are right here looking at the bottom jaw of a bison. So yeah, you see a pretty big jaw right there. Yeah, you see it right there? That's the bone jaw of a bison. And it looks like an ancient bison too. Closely related to the modern day bison. But of course these lived in the ice age and you can see that their horns were much longer. So yeah, and bison are the large, today they are the largest land mammals in North America. Yeah, pretty big. Standing probably about six feet tall. These ones were probably like seven or eight feet tall. Yeah, creatures were much bigger back in the ice age. Yeah, they were very big, bulky beasts. And that's the bottom jaw of one right there. You see the teeth, graze the grasses in the prairies. But interesting fact, before they became the prairie bison, they actually used to be woodland bison. Yeah, living in the woods was probably too dangerous for them because more trees left meant less room for them to run. And if they were being pursued by predators, trees would make it very difficult for these animals to escape. So they adapted into prairie bison, which is a much open, much more open and spacious area for them to escape any attacking predators. So yeah, very big bison. Bison were huge, and these bison were probably even bigger than they are today. Yeah, and to think that these animals used to be so plentiful, but then people started hunting these animals and that almost drove them to the brink of extinction. But yeah, we brought their numbers back up and they're still alive and well today. Yeah, that's a fossil of an extinct bison right there. Pretty cool, right? Yeah, bison were huge and they had many predators too, like wolves and maybe even saber-toothed cats during the Ice Age. Yeah, that's pretty cool, right? Prehistoric bison. And while Ruffalo is the only other herbivore with me on this ex for this exhibit, we want to bring you down here to prehistoric horses right here. Ice Age horse, horse jaw. And then you could see the teeth of a horse right there, young one compared to an old one. But yeah, there used to be horses in North America. North America is where horses originated. And then they migrated over the land bridges into places like Europe. But then they went extinct in North America. And then thousands of years later, European explorers reintroduced the horse back into the Americas. So yeah, that's crazy, right? Horses actually originated in the Americas. That's pretty awesome, right? So this is the bottom jaw of a horse, an Ice Age horse right there, and then there are the teeth right there. See it? Prehistoric horses. And if we come over here, we have the, the lower jaw fragments of a tapir. So yeah, there were also tapir out here. They lived in the swampy lands. Yeah, there used to be tapirs on their war. Yeah, a lot of extinct giants, but these creatures went extinct in North America and now they could be found probably in places like South America. That's pretty cool, right? So you got tape here. And then another creature that is not normally associated with coming from the Americas was the camel. Yeah, just like the horses, camels also originated, originated in North America, but then they went extinct and now we find them today in places like Africa. So yeah, they moved to places like Africa, migrated across the land bridges from North America. And yeah, this is a pretty big bottom jaw camel. See the teeth right there? Front teeth right there, and then that space is kind of empty. But then the teeth come right here. So yeah, this is the lower jaw, and it's pretty big too. These camels were not small. Camels are very big creatures, right? Yeah, the biggest, they were huge. Yeah, you see this? Camel jaw. So yeah, that's a prehistoric camel. And they were probably one hunt camels, kind of like today's dromedary camels. But yeah, you see their bottom jaw right there. So yeah, that's a camel jaw right there. We have a living turkey leg bone compared to the giant condor. Ancient leg bone, ancient condor. Yeah. Today, the California condor is probably one of the biggest birds to fly. Yeah, one of the biggest modern day birds that could fly. But then, back then, there were other large birds of prey, like Argentavis and the Teratornis. We believe the Teratornis was a vulture-like animal, and Argentavis was a giant prehistoric condor. 
sea and the wingspan of these birds could probably measure up to 12 feet in length, making it one of the largest birds to ever fly. So yeah, those, those were some pretty big birds. Imagine what they preyed upon, seeing a giant winged beast coming right at you. Yeah, these pretty big compared to that turkey leg right there. Very big birds. Wouldn't want to be swooped up by that big prehistoric scavenger or predator, whatever it was. Pretty cool exhibits, right? Yeah, we went through all of them, shared some information with you. Yeah, but there's still more to explore, right? Oh yeah, totally. But yeah, just take a look at this. This is what El Paso was like during the Ice Age. These are all the animals found here in the El Paso area during the Ice Age. So yeah, it's pretty cool, right? Dire wolves, saber tooth cats, ground sloths, bison, horses, camels, condors, I got it all out here. Yeah, there's still more to explore, so let's go check it out. Leg bones of some very large dinosaurs. So yeah, we believe this one right here, see it right here? Pretty big leg bone right here. Belong to this one, the Chrysosaurus, which looked like a southwestern hadrosaur. And I'm not sure if you guys remember, but when we went to explore the dinosaur tracks beneath Mount Crystal Ray, yeah, they were three toed and it looked like there was more than one, so it was probably a whole herd of them. So we think that this probably would have left its tracks down there beneath Mount Crystal Ray. Feel free to check out that video because we uploaded a video of our trip over there. Feel free to check out that video. So this is a pretty big leg bone right here. And if you want to read the information right here, the, uh, you can see this long neck sauropod right here. This leg bone right here, see it all the way up to right here? This belonged to the Alamosaurus, which is that dinosaur right there. You see this right here, the Alamosaurus? Feel free to read the information right here. Yeah, pretty big sauropod. Yeah, long neck to reach up the leafy greens high in the trees like a giraffe did. So yeah, this is pretty cool, right? Yeah, very large fossils. Here we got the shell of a glyptodon. I'm sure you all recognize this animal. Yeah, nature's armored experiment. See, that's the glyptodon right there. If you want to read the information right here, feel free. Yeah, feel free to read the information right there. Yeah, this was a giant shelled mammal. Yeah, you want to read that right there too? Pretty cool, right? So yeah, this is the armored shell of a glyptodon. See that shell that protected them from prehistoric predators like the saber-toothed cat? And we think this one was also found in Texas. El Paso, Texas, but can't be too sure. So yeah, this creature was not small. It was an ancient relative of the armadillo, but it was huge, about the size of a small car, measuring 12, about 12 feet from snout to tail. Yeah, it had a very flexible tail, short legs, and then its head, ancient relative of the armadillo, kind of looks like a tortoise mix with an armadillo, right? Yeah, you know what's crazy? Scientists can't even agree on what this creature really looked like. Some people don't think it had a trunk, but the markings on the skull suggest that it did have a trunk, kind of like an elephant did. And then this shell is what kept it protected from predators. So yeah, here's a shell right here. Let's see, this glyptodon shell could probably be made of 1,600 polygonal scoots. So yeah. This is the shell of the glyptodon, pretty big animals, right? Yeah, we, they also find these in the deserts of Arizona too. And these creatures actually originated in South America but came to North America. And when you know what's crazy? The, judging by the shape of their teeth, this creature was a swamp dweller. Yet we find their fossils in the deserts of Arizona. How do we explain that? Well, maybe the answer to that is that Ice Age Arizona wasn't a desert at all. So yeah, it used to be a swamp, which is where this creature could live and eat because those teeth were designed for eating soft, juicy plants. So yeah, once all the ice sucked up all the water in the north, it left a very dry climate, so the swamps evaporated and turned to deserts, which is probably what drove this animal into extinction. So yeah, Cliftodon was a swamp dweller and it lived in Arizona when it was swamps and not desert. Pretty cool, right? Yeah, very large, very interesting, and very bizarre animal. Yeah, <clears throat> Glyptodon was a pretty cool, very strange animal, right? 
Yeah, very big, strange Ice Age giant. Man, this shell is pretty big too. Yeah, and this is probably only a part of the shell, so it gives you an idea of how big this animal really was. Yeah, very big prehistoric relative of the armadillo. Look at this fossil right here. Yeah, turtle shell. Yeah, so this must have been a very big giant turtle. Yeah. See right here? Yep, we can see it. It looks like there's some bones sticking out right there. Yeah, very large turtle shell right here. Pretty cool, right? Yeah, feel free to read the information right there if you like. Pretty cool turtle shell right here. We have Altasso's oldest fossil, over 2 billion years old. Yeah, pretty cool, look at that. This is Altasso's oldest fossil and we're looking at it right here. Pretty cool, right? Feel free to read the information if you'd like right there, pretty interesting, right? Altasso's oldest fossils right here. Here is a timeline right here, chart of the geologic history. So yeah, you can see all them. It goes all the way from the Paleozoic to the Mesozoic to the Cenozoic era. So yeah, Paleozoic right here. You see, yeah, see what it looked like back then. And then you come over here, and it was mostly a world of invertebrates, crustaceans, and fish. All the way over here. But yeah, those are the time periods in the Paleozoic era. And then if we come over here. We got the Mesozoic era right here, which was the age of dinosaurs. So yeah, you see the age of dinosaurs right here. See what the world looked like back then. All these dinosaurs right here. Yeah, pretty cool, right? From the Jurassic, the Triassic and the Cretaceous. And then if we come over here, the Cenozoic era. So yeah, when the Ice Age and the Age of Mammals arose. So yeah, we got fish, and then we got prehistoric mammals up here too. Yeah, see them? Yeah, the sun is all, like, all the way up to the Ice Age. So yeah, those are the prehistoric time periods in the chart of geologic history. Come right here. So yeah, you got a pretty good view of it, right? So yeah, this was Earth over the course of millions and millions of years. Pretty cool, right? Fossils over there, up there. Yeah, pretty cool museum that UTEP has here in El Paso, Texas. So yeah, UTEP, home of the miners. Pretty cool museum they got here, right? So yeah, pretty cool. Glad we got to give you guys a tour of this museum. Viewed all the fossils. Pretty cool, right? Definitely recommend that you guys come and visit, but that's it for now, folks. Thank you for watching. Please be sure to like your content, subscribe if you enjoyed the video, and we'll see you guys later.